Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Finn. Good morning, everyone. And just say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It's uh, very, uh, uh, very helpful for us. Um, I was trying to work out, Claire mentioned the um, webinar that we held in January. I was trying to work out whether it's more daunting to speak to a computer screen with a thousand people at the other end or a room full of people here. I'm not quite sure. But uh, as uh, Claire mentioned, that was a, a very good example, we thought, of how we can try and get information out to as many people as possible uh, around the new inspection model. And that obviously is part of my uh, objective today. I suppose there's sort of three objectives I've got for the, for the uh, talk, really. Firstly, it's about raising awareness. Secondly, it's about providing some level of reassurance. And thirdly, about sharing our experience of the new inspection model so far. Just a brief reminder there of the GPAT strategy role. And you'll see there the emphasis on protect, um, promoting and maintaining health, safety and well-being. And just very briefly about us, we're sort of, um, in terms of categorising our work and how we operate, dividing ourselves really into sort of professional regulation. You'll be familiar with issues around fitness to practice, for example, on that side of things. And then what we're calling the systems regulation, which is really about where inspection comes in, looking at how um, pharmacies are meeting the standards for registered uh, pharmacies, and about requiring owners and superintendents to secure compliance with those standards. And that really is a brief summary of our approach. Our Council's vision is for pharmacy regulation to play its part in improving quality in pharmacy practice and ultimately health and well-being in England, Scotland and Wales. We will, I think, make these slides available for everyone afterwards as well. Professionalism, a key word for us. And this really is sort of um, a key part of our overall approach to inspection. The previous model that many of you will be familiar with, very much emphasis on controlled drugs, but very much a focus from our side of what we've partly called a sort of more of a checklist approach, as our inspectors would go in there, we'd check various documents that were in place, okay, that's fine, move on quite quickly. We felt that that wasn't necessarily capturing a whole world of, of pharmacy practice, and it wasn't really putting a great emphasis on the professionalism that you all have. So we are very much now committed to regulating in a way which supports pharmacists, <laughs> to embrace and demonstrate professionalism in their work. And just to draw your attention to the last two bullet points on there, suggesting that professionalism and not rules and regulations provides the most effective protection for patients, and how prescriptive rules can let us all off the hook. Now, this isn't a question of sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Of course we have rules and regulations, of course we have legal requirements, and of course they're absolutely important to comply with. But a real key part, again, of our approach now is just standing back for a second and thinking, OK, we've ticked all the relevant boxes, we have all our documentation in place, we know we're meeting these requirements, but actually, from a patient's perspective, are we doing everything that we need to be doing to make sure that patient's safety and the service we provide is at the forefront of our thinking? So this is just getting us a bit beyond that level of, of tick-box approach that may have been more prevalent in the past. That will be familiar to some of you, um, a document which looks like that is available, of course, on our website and in hard copy for anyone who requires it. And these were done in September 2012, so they've been around for some time now. And in terms of our approach to standard setting, a focus on outcomes rather than the prescriptive rules, as I just mentioned. What does safe and effective pharmacy practice look like for patients? Recognising that pharmacy professionals are the experts, and that's the key focus. A new accountability structure with pharmacy owners and superintendents accountable for meeting the new standards. I quite like this slide, actually. Any fans of the Beatles here? Good. When I first saw this, it looked like a sort of outtake from the Abbey Road uh, front cover with the four Beatles removed. I wonder whether we're actually going to superimpose four inspectors on there, but we haven't seen fit to do that yet. I'm not quite sure whether that's due to the... Uh, nature of the inspectors themselves, or whether we just thought it was a better idea to leave that blank. But this is actually quite a good way for us of actually describing what we're talking about. I mentioned sort of outcome focus there. We're quite conscious, actually, that in developing our standards and developing our new inspection model, some of the language that we're using is not actually that transparent to people. We often can get quite hung up, I think, in the organisations that we work with, about using particular lang language and recognising that people assume <laughs> that everyone understands the same thing. So this is a way of trying to sort of bring home what outcome actually means. So you put a zebra crossing in, that in itself isn't the outcome. The actual outcome is that people are safer crossing the road as a result of a zebra crossing being there. 
And, for example, people with mobility difficulties find it easy to get about as a result of that. So in the same way that we're suggesting that in a pharmacy you might have a lot of your standard operating procedures in place, you might have lots of good registers and checklists there, fine, but ultimately, is that, is that happening for the patients? Are they safe as a result of it? So that's a sort of just an attempt in a sort of visual way of trying to sort of bring that outcome focus to life. So pharmacies having uh, as their top priority patients, it's quite simple really from our perspective on that basis. But also, just again, just draw your attention to the second bullet point there. Very much up to pharmacies to provide the evidence and examples in whatever way they choose. I'll come on to talk about this in a bit more detail as we go through. In the standards, there are five basic principles. I won't simply read them out. Many of you will be familiar with those. and You'll certainly be able to see these um, on our website and in the published uh, document that I referred to. This is basically how we're actually um, structuring and looking at our inspections now. How are pharmacies meeting those five principles? It's very much about pharmacies meeting the standards every day. Again, we'll talk a bit about preparation for inspection shortly, but we're very keen to get the idea that, although there's obvious nervousness whenever you uh, find yourself subject to any sort of test or exam or inspection, the idea I've got to prepare for that day, that occasion, get everything in place for it. But well, actually, the key point, as you're well aware, is making sure that every single day the patients and people that come to visit you receive the service they need and receive um, everything in the most safe and effective way. And all our inspectors are trying to do is to capture that, albeit going in on a particular day to find it out. So just to emphasise that point about meeting the standards every day being the top priority. So how are we going to know the standards are being met? prototype of our approach has been in operation since the 4th of November. Um, I'll be interested to see just at the end whether anyone's actually experienced a, an inspection yet under the new approach. I actually started in the GPHC on the 7th of October, so a little uh, under a month before the uh, prototype started. So um, I am pretty familiar with having a very steep learning curve as to what on earth the new inspection model looked like, um, as I'm sure some of you are grappling with on that basis. Just a few highlights to um, mention from the model. Obviously a key difference, which again many of you will be familiar with if you've read the literature or attended the webinar before, four indicative judgments of performance. Poor, satisfactory, good and excellent. Lots of conversation and discussion about that and I'm sure there will be lots of views around that uh, today. It's not a, a novel thing in the inspection regulatory world and I'm sure many of you will be familiar for example with Ofsted and their ratings and other inspection models um, have that as well. Um, but it's obviously a new thing in the world of pharmacy. We've actually produced a decision framework, and I was delighted to see that available outside in your pack. It looks like that, so if you haven't seen it already, you'll be able to pick it up from the uh, uh, benches outside. And this is something we published to try and make sure that the judgments that our inspectors are making, you can all see how those judgments are, are being arrived at, and the types of things that are being looked at. I do want to emphasise that there's nothing in inspection which is trying to catch people out. This is, this is all, always a difficult conversation. And... Um, we are trying to be as open and transparent as we can. It's about improving practice and being supportive and helpful, helping people to get there, albeit with that sort of rigour of, uh, of basis to actually make things improve if things aren't there. Um, but I just wanted to share one point that, that from my previous inspection life, something that um, made quite an impression on me, actually. Um, someone who used to be the head of the Prisons and Probation Ombudsman, you might have heard of them, the body that actually investigates deaths in custody, a person who had huge experience of sort of inspection and that sort of world. And he said, with inspection, there's sort of two approaches you can take. One is the approach, which I very much hope and expect us to be adopting, which is supportive, prompting, providing information, and ultimately with that level of rigour if things aren't going well. The other approach is to effectively act like an occupying army, and I thought that was a wonderful description which summarised the idea that inspectors, simply because they have this legal basis for what they're doing, can actually charge into a place, take it over, have no sympathy whatsoever for the pressures that people are under, and actually just assume that um, you know, the world is straightforward and are actually acting in that way that they're sort of in charge. That's not really the approach that we're taking, I'm pleased to say. But I just thought it was quite an interesting example of how inspection can be seen by some people, and in perhaps more extreme examples can be, can be taken by, by some people in this world. Just to mention that our action plans are operational. Action plans are what we are producing and giving to the pharmacists, where we are finding that people are coming out in the poor category, or at the lower end of satisfactory. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute or two. We are producing for the first time a written report. 
Again, this is not new in the inspection and, and regulatory world, but it is new for us. So reports, if you haven't seen any yet, there should be a template, I think, on the website. And there will also be some for, um, examples in, in due course uh, that we're doing on this. But it's a written report. can be anywhere between about two to five pages, where the inspectors will be writing down the evidence that they um, obtain on the site and then producing their, their judgments. Um, our ultimate aim is to publish these reports. Um, that's something we've mentioned from the outset, and again, very typical in the, in the inspection world. That will not be happening during the prototype phase, and there is no sort of date set for when this will happen as yet. One mention at the bottom, and again, I'll just um, explain a bit about this. What we call strategic relationship management has started, and obviously this, this is something of particular interest for, for the audience here. Obviously, we're recognising that in the world of pharmacy, you've got very large groups, various multiples, who have a huge number of branches across the country. We are looking to introduce, or have introduced, this, this strategic relationship management as a way of identifying and getting information more quickly with these bodies. So, for example, where we are finding common um, issues in branches of particular multiples, for example, having a sort of single point of contact in this way is allowing us to get that information out there more quickly and things to improve in practice and also allowing us to get a bit more detailed information about how the sort of operating models and processes that apply in these places work. If we have that information coming at us and we know that X number of branches across the country operate like that, our inspectors can spend a bit less time checking some of the documentation in the actual pharmacy and seeing how it operates in practice. But just to emphasise that although we're doing that, this is not a case of ignoring the independent world at all, far from it. It's simply a way of managing the relationships there. Through uh, sessions such as today and through all manner of things I hope we'll be doing over the next year or so, we are absolutely <coughs> wedded to the idea of making sure that all the independents receive as much information as possible, all the opportunities to get information to us where you have issues and concerns, and it's something that I have continuing conversations with, with Finn and Claire about. So those labels that I mentioned, a brief summary there. <clears throat> Poor, satisfactory, good and excellent. These were the product of huge amounts of uh, discussion, certainly well before I arrived. Um, you can see, if you look, um, as we have done, um, across the sort of regulatory world, great um, divergence in the sort of descriptions and terms that are used and how people come to that. Um, with this, we tried to make as simple as possible. Um, whether we've succeeded, we're, we're still checking on that. But a poor pharmacy, right at the bottom of the spectrum, would be one which has failed to achieve the pharmacy standards overall. Major concerns that require immediate improvement. Satisfactory will be achieving all or the majority of the standards, may require some improvement on a number of, of less serious issues. A good will be achieving all the standards consistently and has review arrangements in place that ensure continual improvements in the quality and services. Excellent at the very top end, we're demonstrating not only all the hallmarks of a good pharmacy, but we'll be looking at either innovative or unique services that meet the health needs of the local community and that other pharmacies might learn from. We tested this new model in um, quite detailed form before we actually launched a prototype on the 4th of November. Feedback, people value the instant feedback that they're getting. Inspectors will, at the end of each inspection, provide a summary of what they've actually found, and pharmacists will welcome that. Show and tell approach welcomed. This is something that we're <laughs> trying to find a way of describing our inspection approach, and the show and tell is the sort of basis that we've come across here. So, as I mentioned from one of the earlier slides, rather than our inspectors just simply checking whether X amount of documentation is in place and things are bolted securely to floors or whatever, actually asking pharmacists, and crucially the pharmacy team as a whole, how are you meeting the standards? Now, this is, is interesting. Many of us like to be told, what do I need to do? Just tell me what I need to do. I'll do it. Here you are. Are we okay with that? Putting the onus on ourselves to actually say, to actually think, well, how do I go about doing that? It's actually more difficult, but actually much more engaging and allows much more opportunity for people to actually show their professional judgment and how they're actually operating in practice. It's quite difficult, though. Many of you, or some of you, might be familiar with competency frameworks if you've moved around different organisations or have heard about that. The sort of common way that people in organisations generally these days will have to uh, move up the ladder or apply for jobs, you'll see a series of competencies on there. In a previous life, I remember when um, my organisation at the time introduced that, there was a lot of phrases which, again, were a bit sort of uh, opaque to me. Things like, um, tell me how you monitor and evaluate your work. And I was like, what? What? That was conveying to me some sort of research work going on. I thought, well, I don't know, I don't really do that, really, unless it's a big sort of research thing. So lo and behold, I was marked down on that and didn't actually get the job I was applying for. 
When I actually looked at what they meant in this, it was basically very, very obvious. So obvious, I'd never even thought to raise it. And this, I think, is a challenge that you will face when our inspectors are asking, well, tell me how you do that. Because, particularly when you've done this for a large amount of time, you will actually do things instinctively. Well, of course I do it like that. Of course that's there. But actually, it's a bit of a challenge to actually think, why do I do it like that? Why is that so good? And why is it working? So I would encourage you to try and think about things like that. Um, in the example that I was talking about, about monitoring and evaluating, things I did quite routinely, check what was being asked for, what date did they want it by, and when I sent it, were they happy with it? Well, it was blindingly obvious to me that that's what I did. I didn't think to actually tell the person who was interviewing me, but that's what I was doing. So there's just something about sort of stepping back from your daily work and thinking, how and why do I do that? And actually um, telling the inspector. And the other thing that I think I mentioned at the end of the webinar, don't wait for the inspector to ask you a question. If you think there are things that are brilliant, fantastic in your pharmacy, tell the inspector. Tell them the three, four things that you're most proud about. That's evidence they'll take, they'll take into account. They might check it, they might question it. In fact, they should do. But that's op offering you the opportunity to let the inspector know what's working. Or if you know there are things that are actually in need of improvement and you're taking action to do that, tell that as well. The fact you've actually identified those, and are proactively taking action yourself, is fine, and that will be reflected in the rating you're given. But again, it's quite a, a, a different approach from before. And again, many of us, when we face this sort of test or inspection environment, can be a bit sort of nervous and we'll just wait to see what's being asked, and hopefully they won't ask anything too difficult, whatever. Get yourselves on the front foot. Tell us what you're doing. Tell us why your patients love your pharmacy. Tell you why you're so safe. All that information will be brilliant for the inspector to have. I mentioned the pharmacy team as, as a whole there, and this is a, something that we're quite pleased about with the new model so far, particularly with the feedback we're getting. Actually speaking to all members of the pharmacy team, it feels much more inclusive and people really like the opportunity from, from our experience of speaking to the inspector about what's going on there. The inspector is on site for longer at the moment. We put out on our website at the start of the prototype phase our hope and expectation that inspections would generally last around two hours. That's not the case in practice. Inspections are taking longer. Um, although some are around that two-hour mark, the average is probably between three and four at this point in time. We are very aware of this. Clearly, you're running a business. You're managing patient safety on a daily basis. The more time we're in there, the more we're impacting on you. We recognise that. Um, a couple of things on it. Clearly, we have to be in there to get the evidence we need to perform our statutory function. So we can't apologise, won't apologise for being there. We've just spent um, a couple of days on quite detailed training sessions ourselves, challenging ourselves to think how we can run our inspections in a more streamlined way to make sure that we're getting what we need but actually get out of there sooner than, than we are at the moment. So we are actively pursuing that. One thing I would say, though, and the feedback we're getting from pharmacists who are supporting this, is that even though the time is longer, and probably longer at the moment than we hope it will be, in the overwhelming majority of cases, pharmacists are saying that it's not actually affecting how we're actually dealing with patients. Our inspectors, all of whom are pharmacists themselves and understand this, this sort of issue, are always, no, no, you need to deal with that with the patient first. I'll go back, I'll check things in the corner, that's fine. You deal with that as a priority. Now, that's very much the approach they'll continue to take. I do recognise, though, that the mere fact the inspector is there provides that added pressure. Of course it does. But we are working very hard to make sure we can be as efficient as possible on that. Just a couple of things about the feedback we've received so far. Um, a few things around um, the feedback being helpful, the inspector explaining clearly what would happen, and he's identified whether the pharmacy was performing well. So again, just uh, re-emphasising that point that it's not about trying to catch people out. Yes, if things are wrong, we will identify that and we'll make sure that's clear, but it's also about finding the things that are working really well. Now, people are talking about a much clearer understanding of the standards after the inspection. And just a few more uh, quotes there, which I'll let you read. I said at the start that one of my objectives was to try and provide some reassurance. It's obviously very um, daunting, thinking about a new model and what it's going to mean in practice, but the inspectors are actually quite human. Having just spent two days with them, I can just about uh, guarantee that, I think, for most of them. But they are, as many of you will have experienced before, very good at engaging with people, very supportive in practice in most, in most cases. They're very keen to actually explain about the standards, to explain why they're asking certain things, and to try and draw information out. So people, I think, 
But again, I'll be interested to see if anyone's had this experience so far. All the feedback we're getting is actually saying, that was good. They actually put me at my ease. I understood why things were being asked for. I understood what I was able to do. So it is quite a, a human approach to that. A couple of things about feedback around improvement areas. Many people um, would say, actually, wouldn't it be better if you told us exactly when and where you were coming? We could prepare for it accordingly and things would be a lot better. I'll see an argument, and I've had these conversations with Phil and others, and I'll continue to have these conversations over the next few months. Many also understood the need for unannounced visits. At the moment, our general practice is to issue what we call like a notification letter around sort of four to six weeks before the inspection um, is due to occur. So it will not specify the date or the time of arrival, but we'll provide that sort of, it's coming in the near future, be aware of that. Um, there is a lot of um, interest in this in the sort of regulatory world, certainly a move over recent times for more unannounced inspections. It's common practice, for example, in different bodies like the Inspector of Probation, the Inspector of Prisons. Um, but there are different models. Ofsted generally have done a sort of 48-hour approach warning. Others, certainly the inspectors I was in previously, which tended to do much more detailed long-term inspections, would often write out well in advance and receive lots of detailed information in, in advance, analyse that information and then test it on the actual site, wherever that might be. So there are different models around that, and I'm keen to get more feedback on it. I think uh, I would not like to raise expectations that we would move away from the more unannounced and not setting appointments. I think that's highly unlikely, if I'm honest. Um, but I'm also keen to hear the feedback on that particular point because there is obviously as I was saying as we are putting more onus on you to actually show and tell the idea of you being aware of what you need to do obviously plays into that we've also now asked for some feedback from owners and superintendents um, that's only just started so I wouldn't suggest this is representative of more than a, a small proportion of, of um, respondents so far but again very positive people are certainly liking the reports recognising that the judgments that we're making are actually in line with this decision-making framework. So we are challenging people. If you don't think our inspectors are actually following this, and you think their judgments are not in line with it, let us know. But actually, the feedback we've got so far is very positive on that. Again, crucially, the last bullet point, the most important one for me, really, um, has helped us think about how we can improve the quality of services, prompting that way of thinking, which is good. A few more there. The positive, helpful and friendly style of the inspector. So again, hopefully that assurance as to what it actually feels like in practice from the pharmacist's perspective. A few areas for improvement though. We'd appreciate more time to reflect on our inspection report and comment. We are looking very closely at the sort of timescales that we've actually introduced as part of this model and one of the things that we've done is actually require uh, comments on our reports within two days, which is quite challenging. In practice, um, actually, many people are meeting this, certainly far more than, 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 than are not. But we do recognise that can be a challenge if people are, want to check things or if they're not available at the time. So we will look at the feedback we're getting around that. The second one goes back to what I was saying before. There are still areas that are grey. Are we told to think about how we do something? I like to be told what's acceptable and what's not. Get that, understand this, and I think we can all sympathise with that, but that really isn't the way things, things are working. It's much more about thinking yourselves about how you're doing stuff and informing the inspector as a result. But just to highlight the um, third point as well, um, concerns about our future intentions of publishing the reports because of certain sensitive information, which might, some people are arguing, the prescription numbers that feature in the reports, or other issues around security, for example. Just to emphasise that we're not publishing during this prototype phase, so there's no question of that happening as yet, but we are very interested in this and looking to get more feedback from people around that. There are many ways reports can be written in terms of the specific details that are included or not. But we need to be alive to the issues of concern that people have around that and make an informed decision about the level of detail that's actually published. Just to mention, um, a lot of resources now available. Um, our website has now got a, a specific inspection section, which has got various things on there including a quite couple of disturbing videos, which uh, you may or may not have seen, but I'll encourage you to have a look at those if you want to. Uh, quite a lot of documentation on there. And one thing I just mentioned to um, Finn before um, the session started, we're very keen to actually put some examples or case studies on the website in the near future, which is a way, again, of trying to bring things to life. Um, my working week tends to be awash with large-scale documents to read through, with the best one in the world, it gets dull at the best of times, even if you have the time to read them. And I know a lot of you will struggle to find the time to do a lot of this stuff, given the, the pressures you're under on a daily basis. 
we're constantly looking and thinking of things that actually allow people to access information as quickly as possible. And I think one of the bits of feedback we've had so far, particularly around the labels, is, OK, we get the idea that it's for us to tell you what we're doing, you can make the judgments, but can't you give us a bit more about what good looks like or what satisfactory looks like? This gives you some prompts, but actually um, we're going to try and put, as I say, some case studies or examples on there, which hopefully will just prompt that thinking and think, God, yeah, I see that. We've done this with a couple of groups recently, and there were some great quotes, actually, from people. Um, my favourite being, Christ, I thought we were good till I read this report, which was quite, quite good. And it wasn't that the one that he'd seen was actually in a world different from his own. There's lots and lots of little things on there. We're just like, oh, yeah, I can see how we can do that. Oh, that's good. So I think we can do a lot more of that. It's still placing the onus on yourself to think about your particular pharmacy and what you're doing, but actually it would just help give a sense of what else is going on in the wider world that you can learn from. I'll be looking to do that around the different ratings and also areas where we found that things were not good and needed action plans and those types of things and how they've been actually improved. So that I hope will be a further resource that will be useful. Um, Finnet and colleagues have put together various bits of information as well for people. Um, you've also seen out there the um, material that the Royal Pharmaceutical Society has produced as well, and that's quite a helpful summary guide. So there is an increasing amount of information out there um, to try and actually help people through the process. Um, questions was the next thing. The only thing I was going to say was just, to, just before we get into that was just to actually emphasise that point I said about think about the three things you're most proud about and tell the inspector that. That's a really good prompt for inspection. That's all I wanted to say by way of, of talk, but I'm happy to have as many questions as the time permits, Finn, so I'll leave you to manage the time for your, for your programme. Oh, thank you. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, good question. Quite a few questions in there. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of the evidence of people being supportive, well, I mean, the evidence I've got in terms of the feedback we've received from quite a large number of, of pharmacists is, is good on that basis. So what the inspectors are doing is at the end of each inspection is providing a feedback form to the pharmacist either to complete at the time or to complete online at a later date if they prefer to do that. And I'm not actually spinning anything here. The actual response rate and the actual content is universally good. I can think of one or two cases where people have said, well, it might have been better if that had happened. The strongly agree and agree it comes out around 95, 98% all the time in terms of how the inspectors approached it. So I would rely on that in terms of how the actually inspectors approached um, by our, our team. Many of the team have experience of being independent pharmacists themselves. We have people who've worked for multiples, who've done both, who've only worked as independents, who've spent years doing it, spent a short time. That cross-section is actually very useful for me, certainly having that, and it allows quite good challenging and approaches. So um, people are understanding of the pressures and understanding of the different approaches to dependence. We have absolute clarity ourselves that nothing in this model should favour an independent or a multiple. It's an inspection model for everyone dealing with, with pharmacy. We are alive to that particular point, and we are alive to particular particular difficulties that independence will have. So a really useful chat I was having with a colleague earlier, just beforehand actually, and we were talking about how quite clearly with multiples, many of them will have significantly more resources than are available to many of you. With a head office function, which might be able to produce um, more documentation, be able to review things, review trends more clearly, and all that sort of stuff, if it's done, fine, good, and I expect we'll take account of that. But actually, you also have lots of things that you could argue that some of the multiples don't have. For example, I know many of you will have said, and I've heard this in many of the, the sessions I've been, the way you can interact with a lot of your patients, many of whom we, you have had 
coming to you for many years, for example, that level of service and what you provide there, that's all particular and can actually be a benefit on the independent side. I think the most crucial thing, though, is, you know what I was saying before about how this is not about a tick box exercise, not so much about prescriptive rules. What our inspectors are most interested in is what's happening in practice. So yes, there might be situations where some of the documentation isn't perhaps as glossy or as filled in or as perfect as some of the multiples have done. Actually, that is not going to be fundamental at all here. If you can show in practice, and your team can show, this is how you deliver the service, and this is why it's safe, and this is what we've done to improve things, great. So it's that element of encouraging it, rather than worrying so much about what some of the multiples might be able to produce in terms of that documentation. That probably isn't the whole level of assurance you're looking for. I hope it gives a sense of, A, the support, B, where we're coming from in terms of that equality, if you like, but also in practical terms why independents can actually demonstrate things just as well, if not better, than some of the multiples in some of those cases. Not as yet, for perfectly good reasons, because we haven't fully defined it yet. This is still a prototype phase, as I was saying. We're not publishing information and going live with that sort of stuff. Um, we are actually trying to get um, a lot of information from people about what they think this should be, and it provokes quite interesting debates. Um, but there are examples of poor, there are examples of satisfactory, and there are examples of good in our um, inspection so far. So as I was saying, as we produce some information of case studies or examples, we are able to see some of those things that are on there. But I would certainly be interested if anyone has actually undergone an inspection or one of their colleagues might have done any particular comments or things that you have from there, particularly if perhaps you agree with what I've said or your experience is actually very different. That would be useful for everyone to hear as well. So happy to have that. Okay. So you know, just on the other point, yes, where, where things are identified for improvements, people will be given an, ac an action plan listing where that needs to happen, and then the inspector will confirm once that's done, yes, okay, that means the standard's now met, so you'll be at that satisfactory level or whatever. I think the other point you raised is interesting, and I think somebody raised that at the end of the webinar as well, actually. I think it's highly unlikely that we are going to re-inspect on application. It would be in unfeasible, basically, given 14,500 pharmacies, people writing in saying, hey, come and look at us now, we've done that. I don't think that's feasible. Um, I do get the point that if people see that label was published, they want to have the best as possible. Um, I recognise that point, and I think it's something we need to think about before we get into the actual publication of it. I suppose all I would say, again, is if people constantly think there are ways to improve, you should be doing that anyway for, for your patients, and you will be doing that. Um, so that's, that's where I think we are at with it. But I think before we get to the publication, we will think about this a lot more in terms of the implications of publishing the actual ratings. There's lots of points around this in terms of how we actually get information for patients, where the information would be, what exactly is published, and what the implications are. We are acutely conscious of how information can be used for different purposes by media, for example, or others, where labels are used. So we are very alive to that, and I think it's something that's either through sessions like this and with other groups, we'll actually come back and seek further views on in terms of the actual detail of what's published and those sorts of issues. So I'm not giving you a 100% answer, I'm afraid, to that today, but well before things are published, we will have much more consultation with people. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, I think certainly where we identify things for improvement, that is a valid point that makes sure that when things are published, the fact that those improvements have been made are actually reflected. And that's obviously right. It's only fair for the pharmacist, and it's obviously most useful for the public to have the most up-to-date information. I think it's that other, other side of things, where things are good, and somebody says, hey, I've just done X, Y, and Z, I want that reflected on there. That's more challenging. And I think that's where, as I say, one issue where we need to have a, a bit more thought before we actually get around to actually publishing. Yep. Yep. Okay, two ways. At the moment, as I say, once the inspector's completed the report, and we're actually doing um, significant sort of quality assurance ourselves, so our four regional managers actually quality assure every report before it goes off to the superintendent. That's going for what we call factual accuracy checks, which is like, you know, designed to actually deal with any points of concern at the time. And I should say just before that, that inspectors are also asking the... Uh, responsible pharmacists on the day to sort of check and sign the evidence the inspectors collected is actually accurate. So that's a way of trying to make sure that any disagreements can be worked out at the earlier stage. If it's not then, then at that stage of factual accuracy, come back and say, hang on, you've written that, that's not clear, what do you mean by that? So that hopefully would deal with the overwhelming majority of situations where there was some disagreement. Um, we recognise that even with that, there might still be cases where still not happy with this, this isn't in line with what you're saying. We're actually just finalising at the moment a sort of formal review process whereby um, the superintendent, for example, would, would actually be able to say, write in to me, for example, to say, you know, this is what's happened, these are the reasons why I'm not satisfied with it, it's not in line with your practices, I want this inspection reviewed, I want the judgment changed. What we're looking for there is for me to then allocate somebody entirely separate from that original inspection team to conduct a review or investigation of that to actually substantiate or not the points there. So do recognise it needs to be that right to reply. As I say, we would hope in practice in the overwhelming majority of cases it will be resolved quite easily through initial conversations, but obviously a more formal process for when something isn't agreed. Okay. The general inspection cycle has been around three years, um, and that's, it's not likely to be significantly um, less than that in the future. We're looking certainly longer term at having a more sort of risk-based approach, and we are we'll look, for example, at things where we identify people as poor, for example, whether they might need an inspection more frequently. But the overall cycle is probably around, likely to be around that. Um, in most cases, as I say at the moment, we will issue a notification letter so we will have that sort of awareness that the inspection will be due in four to six weeks. There are occasions when completely unannounced inspections take place. Um, that might be, for example, if we'd received as an organisation some information, some allegations or some complaints that we thought it would actually be sensible to actually go and check that out without actually notifying. Um, that's on the fewer side of things rather than the more usual notification procedure. But again, that's actually one area where we are looking to sort of clarify some things at the moment. And obviously it ties in with what I was saying before at the point that I know Fred and others have said about why can't you let us know 48 hours in advance. So we are looking again at that sort of notification unannounced thing. So expect a bit more information on our website in due course around our procedures around that. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, actually, and there is no doubt if you've got somebody there who knows that well, the ability to actually say and talk about the culture and the information that's there is obviously more prevalent. I think the challenge that we will grapple with with that is obviously as a member of the public, you go in at pharmacy, it's whoever's there at the time, and we need to be assured as a regulator that even on those days when the pharmacies might be away or whatever, that the actual service and procedures are as safe as possible. So that's where the sort of emphasis has gone and is at the moment but I do take your point and as I say this is something that we are looking at in terms of the feedback we're receiving because I've had that point from a, from a few people and it's, it's a very valid one.
through coffee. Now, you, know, yeah. you can't stay for lunch, but certainly you don't mind handling some questions. No, that's true. You're more than happy yeah. to, yeah. yeah. Just, that's all I want to do. Yeah, please, man. Thank you. Okay, so I want to try and talk about how independence is going to meet these standards. And actually, first of all, can I just pick up how important is it for you? Who wants to be registered as poor or marked up as poor? Is there anybody in the room? I'll just check in. You never know. Who wants to be satisfactory? No. Who wants to be good? At least as a minimum, who wants to be good? Okay. And who wants to be excellent? Wow. That's really good news. I mean... It's not surprising, and because we're all the same, we want to be there. Um, we've done an awful lot of work, both with Mark and his team, and, and other independents who've been through this. Um, s- some of the comments that have come back, actually there's been some independents who've been marked as good, but actually some of the different models of pharmacy have found it easier to become good. And I'm going to explain to that's why. So if you're a distance-selling pharmacy, it's potentially much easier to be a good pharmacy because you've so limited risk in it. You're not dealing with patients walking into your pharmacy. And so the model that you're operating is quite different. I want to put that into perspective of what you need to think about within your pharmacy to become good or excellent. And certainly we'll work with the GPC to try and find out that standard for excellent. Um, I think there's a bit of a dilemma at the minute between us because you think it should be quite unique and maybe only 2% of the, 1% of the population, quite less. And we think it actually should be 20, 30, 40%. But one thing that the standards is definitely showing at the minute, they're going to evolve. And that bar is going to rise and rise and rise. Okay? So this is a continual moving feast, and we've got to find to get it right. And on this bit about revalidation or re-inspections, I think we've got one chance at the minute to get it right. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today, is how we can best get it right in the first instance before we get it. Um, uh, we've just picked, there's lots of different examples out there of working at the MPA, Elfiga, Newmark, Avicenna, IPF, everybody's there. But I've just chosen the uh, Society's one today because um, I think it's a quite a good one in terms of how their approach to it is. So the suggestion you print this out and you give it to every member of your team to get through it. I want to pick up, for me, the hardest section is actually the governance. It's the first section. And the first question on it, the risks associated with providing pharmaceutical service are identified and managed. Oh my God, how the hell can I identify all of these risks? It's, it's impossible, right? But they're not asking us to identify all the risks. What they're actually saying is, what risks have you identified and show me how you've dealt with it, okay? And some of the things that we can think about in that are things like near misrecording, right? And we're not saying, they're not saying they need a whole protocol about near misrecording, but actually they want to see that you've identified how it's done, that you have recorded it, but how have you dealt with it? So one of the pharmacies we spoke to said, well, actually we deal with that as and when it comes up. We speak with the pharmacist, the, the, the people who are involved in it, we recognize and record why it happened, and then we have a team meeting the next morning, and we brief everybody on it. And then we check it and see if it's happened again. So it's not saying that this is all about rules and regulations and protocols and SOPs, but it's about recognizing how you do it in your pharmacy and sharing that experience and making sure that the staff can tell the same story as you do. Um, that the safety and quality of services are reviewed and monitored. So if you are offering a service, when do you review it? How well do you know you're performing it? And how well do you know when the outcomes are getting better or worse? Okay? And again, in some of the handouts we've done, we've put in some KPIs. But on that, it's not just about the number of smoking quits you've done, but it's that rate of smoking quits. And has it improved from last year? Has it gone worse? What do you need to do with the staff? So just by starting to record some numbers, you're able to change some of those things that you're doing. Um, and and uh, Mark mentioned that we've given you the pack for this. This is really good, and it's really worthwhile working through at the minute, so you've got it. So another one in terms of the risks associated with it, I have a colleague in Stockport, his pharmacy got burnt down uh, at, and he got a phone call at half eight on a Monday morning about it being burnt down. Now, actually, he had a plan, and by half nine on the Monday morning, he's a heavy dispensing addict population, he'd opened a new pharmacy, 
four doors down. He'd got methadone from another pharmacist down the road. He'd got his wholesalers to send him the next ones. He'd arranged for the drug service to send the GP in to support him with the prescriptions. And he was dispensing to his addicts at half nine. Now, if an inspector comes in and says, have you measured your risks? Show me your... What have you done to show me your risks? And you go, well, there's my plan for if something happens to the pharmacy and it works. He's going to go, oh, my God. Nobody else has got that. And suddenly you're definitely in the good side as opposed to being in the standard. Would that be right now? Yeah? So this isn't about just being terrified. It's about thinking it through a little bit and doing it. But it's also about the team being involved in it. Okay, so the next one, feedback concerns about the pharmacy service and the team can be raised by individuals and action taken. So how comfortable are your team if a locum comes in and isn't acting the way you would act? Have they, can they come and talk to you about it or have they got somebody else that they can go to and share that? Okay, or how, what about a manager that's running your pharmacy? Have they, can your team come to you and say, we're really concerned about this pharmacist? Or, can't, or we're concerned about the dispenser. Or we're concerned about the counter system. And if you've got those things in place and share that with the inspector, it's very powerful stuff. Another one, appropriate indemnity or insurance arrangements are in place. I know we've got the best of the best in the room today. But when inspectors come back to you and say, people don't understand the difference between their indemnity insurance and their shop insurance, it's quite scary. Okay? We all have two types of insurance. We just need to be able to demonstrate that we've got the two types of insurance. And when the inspector comes in, you go, there's my insurance. And actually being prepared for this is what it's all about. That's a must, by the way. It's not very obvious in here what's our need to do and what are musts. And I appreciate you can't necessarily want to do that. But I'm telling you now that if you ain't got your indemnity insurance in place, um, they're going to close you down because that's a massive risk to the public and this is about the risks to the public um, information is managed to protect the privacy, dignity and confidentiality of patients that's quite a scary one because how many of us talk to our patients in the front of the shop have we really managed that confidentiality with the situation we may well have done but we've got to think about this through and it's quite challenging. So when you're looking at a distance selling model, they don't have all the patients standing in the pharmacy listening to the conversation they're having. They're having them on the phone, or they're doing it by email, or they're doing it by letter. But for us in a general practice scenario, that's quite challenging. What I do love about this that the society has put out, it's actually given every member of the team the documentation to look at and think about. They're asking them then to come back and reflect on it and feedback. And as a group to work it through right? and that's the critical bit this isn't the pharmacist doing it or the manager or the owner doing it on their own, this has got to be about the team it's a different way of working and that's the one thing that you've got to take away from today we can't do this on our own we have to involve everybody in it this is quite blank deliberately, I haven't forgotten to put the slides up there are tons of solutions out there We've started with a webinar and we're here today to make people aware of it and start talking about how you can make it better. The MPA, Newmark, Alfiga, Avicenna, uh, Profarm, Beta, all of us have got bits and pieces of stuff there to do. Okay? But if we go back and historically look at what's happened, we've bought our SOP pack from Newmark. And the inspector comes in and says, where's your SOPs? And you pull the file out and say, there's my SOPs. Practice goes, great, we've ticked that box. How many of you have got an SOP in there for doing MDS dispensing, but you don't actually do MDS dispensing? If you start to do it the old way, you will fall on your face. Because the inspector is going to open up the SOPs and go, oh, right, I'm going to talk to Joanne about your MDS dispensing SOP and see if she knows about it. This idea of an off-the-shelf package doesn't work anymore. Everything has to be individualised. It has to be individualised to your pharmacy. And the staff have got to know and understand it. If you want to be good or excellent. Okay? If you want to be standard, 
you'd probably get away with it. And indeed, there's going to be some pharmacies who want to be standard because they're so busy, this is a real challenge to put into place. Okay? But I suspect as time moves on, we'll all want to be good or excellent. It is individuals. We've got to recognise the risks that we see in our pharmacy. Not that the MPA or Newmark or anybody else sees. It's our pharmacy. We know how it works. How do we deal with waste? How do we deal with sharps? How do we deal with staff? All of those things have got to be identified. Training is acutely important. And we're working with other providers to support that for you. As I say, we've taken a very much a partnership role to this. As the IPF, we can't do this for you. You've got to work with others to do it for enable it. Um, the, the biggest one for me is probably the whistleblowing aspect of it as well. So actually, if you start hearing something that's going on in the surgery that's affecting patients, how do we deal with it? Or if a member of staff sees a parent smacking a child or another person, how do they deal with that? That's the things inspectors are going to be asking about. Acutely aware of this in the safety perspective of it. So I hope I've already given you an idea of what the inspectors actually want at the minute, and so has Mark. So what does busy pharmacy need to do this? And actually, how can we better prepare? And I think, to an extent, it is a bit like the SOP file, except it's not. It's about the inspection file. And it's an inspection file as a live working document. You pull it off the shelf and you go, here's your protocol, here's your, what you want to look at, and here's how we've prepared for it. And I'll let you sit in the dark room and go and look at that and see how good it is and tell me where I need to develop from it. But we need to be prepared. And I'm afraid it's only stuff that we can do ourselves but working with other people. Okay? The real problem here is the pharmacist working with two, three, four staff. This is going to be quite labour intensive. But what we've looked at is trying to develop a solution in partnership with others that will help. I'm going to come to that in a second. Mark did rec um, Mark mentioned a, a single point of access in terms of doing it. That's something we would love to work with GPHC and develop on behalf of independence as well. So we recognise, as Rini has said, that actually we're the hardest people to get to. But when you come on to the next talk that we've got, you feel that we do some of the best things for the public. And it's important to recognise that balance. Hopefully this will work. Inside your brochures, or inside your packs today, there was this document. Okay, and it's from the exact group. We're not here selling the exact group services. All right? Please, the IPF doesn't do that. This is, about, this is a solution that's available, but I want to give you an example of how it's going to work. And, and we have negotiated a deal for you on their behalf. If you want to look through it, um, just while we talk, it gives you... First page is just a brief overview of what the company does, okay, and how they operate. But actually, there are two solutions that support independence. There's an online solution that is quite uh, sensibly priced. And just to give you something in terms of the resource management, they help you with job descriptions, contracts, employee handbooks, induction processes, working time regulations, equal opportunities, uh, appraisals, performance managers, and grievances. How many of us have got those in place? I know some of you in the room have bought other consultants in to do it. We spoke about this before. I know some of you are using the MPA and other services to do this. But I'm absolutely certain that most independent contractors don't have it in place. So if you don't have this in place, how have you managed your risks? That's just in terms of HR. If we look at the health and safety side of it, have we done our key tests and procedures? Have we got our accidents in the first aid sorted out? Have we got universal access, fires, slips, trips, return medicines, waste management, infection control? This is all things that the inspectors will inspect us to have in place. But if we haven't got them, how can we do that? They do two services. One's an online service and the other's actually where they'll physically come into the pharmacy and work with you. And certainly in terms of... Um, and the health and safety aspect of it, we use this company and we find it exceptionally beneficial. They come in, they spend half a day in the pharmacy and they helped us produce our health and safety file. Not only that, they came back six months later and checked that we'd done what we said we needed to do to make sure we were compliant with health and safety. Now, 
sharing that with an inspector, and I should have brought it along with me, but trust me, it's an A4 file that is this thick. It will make a massive difference to your inspection procedure. Because there, that's the sort of level that the multiples have got to for independent struggle. But not only that, it is good practice. It's what we should be doing. Okay? Um, As an exclusive offer, and if any of you want to talk to me this later, it's there. The online service isn't available to anybody else at the minute, and it's £200 for health and safety and £200 for HR. Um, or if you buy the two, it's £300. The, the extended versions are normally 575 and 550 but they're 499 for IPF members, and they're 900 as a combined total. I appreciate that might sound like an awful lot of money. But actually, if we look at the amount of time we're spending doing it ourselves, and you put this in place, it transforms your business. Okay? As I say, we're not here to try and sell this to you. What we're trying to do is put in a solution that will help you get to good an awful lot quicker than if you try and do it on your own. And this is a really powerful tool. Not only that, but we will commit to working with Exact to actually make this the best solution that's out there and potentially become the single point of access for, for, for independence in it, or one of the points of access for independence. Um, and they're very keen to work with it. This isn't just an IPF solution. They're working with over 900 contractors at the minute. So it's a very powerful company and a very powerful tool. Okay, so thank you very much indeed. I think we're just about time for coffee, but if anybody wants to ask any questions before we break for coffee, either for myself or Mark, we're really welcome. Thank you. Any questions? No. Everybody wants the coffee. Okay. Okay, we're running a few minutes behind. It's fine because I know we're going to catch up a little bit later. So if I just break the coffee now and to come back and make it past 11, if you could come back in at um, 22 12. So we'll just be 10 minutes behind. So 20 to 12, and then we'll have the presentation and come back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>